Um, so we are excited to be hosting this event today. Um, we do a number of events called our signature series where we do a deeper dive in certain verticals within robotics. Um, so earlier this year, we did one in manufacturing and robotics. Um, this one we're doing in agriculture, but we're doing this one a little bit differently than we normally do. Um, we actually have a great panel uh, of folks who can give us a little bit more insight into some of the challenges around why is technology as broadly if not being adopted in the rates we think they should be in agriculture? What are the, some of the challenges? And then what are some of the opportunities? Um, following that, we have some folks who are going to talk a little bit more about uh, the, the agriculture market as a whole. And then we have some startups who are going to be talking about what they're doing. Um, so we're really excited about the mix. Um, and we're excited to be joined by uh, Peter from one of our partners, Danforce, who is going to really be the, the key driver, who was the key driver in getting this uh, event set up uh, and will be leading us through the day. So, Peter, I'll turn it over to you. Hi. Thank you very much for everybody for coming. And uh, I'll be quick on an introduction, but I figured I'd kind of set some of the table on on uh, on why we're here so so i'm from danfoss i run the autonomous vehicle group at danfoss there's some other people from danfoss in the room um but not going to talk a lot about danfoss today but i will give those an introduction to the company that are not familiar with it so danfoss is about forty-two thousand people about 11 billion dollars in revenue 100 factories in more than 20 countries and is a privately held company and has been since it was founded in 1933. It's still family owned by the same family uh, as the founder did when he founded it. And the nice thing about being family owned is Danfoss only really does business if it can achieve one or more of these global megatrends. So either addresses climate change, addresses urbanization, electrification, food and water supply, or digitalization. So we are a large industrial company and the challenge probably about 20 or 30 years ago was can you make money off of improving the environment through climate change, electrification? Can you improve the food and water supply and not just rely on government grants to do it, but do it as an industrial company? So Danfoss has really three focus areas, three businesses that we, we operate in. So Danfoss Power Solutions, which is the largest business and is the business that our autonomous vehicle team is in, is really a large supplier into the off-highway mobile markets. So construction, uh, industry in general for manufacturing. We do some work on highway, trucking, and buses. We, we joke with our head of electrification that he's the Elon Musk of school buses because about 80 or 90% of electric school buses are uh, Danfoss powered. But our largest market for power solutions is by far agriculture. Our top customers are all in agriculture, and most of them are, are the uh, OEM names that you would recognize all the way down to the, 55, the long tail of about 5,500 other OEMs that support the space. But the two other business segments that we work in actually touch the food, the agriculture value chain kind of across the way as well. So we do some heating and cooling, but mainly a lot of the cold chain capabilities. So any kind of mirrors container and things like that has a lot of our cold chain equipment in it all the way to the supermarket, all the way to actually monitoring the supermarkets for failures is all managed by Dan Foss throughout the world. And then our electronics and drives, power electronics and drives, a lot of the Breweries, packaging companies, all of those things use our drive components as well. So just to give everyone an introduction to agriculture that don't know it, I think most people in here have a, have a good idea of it, but if you're coming more from the robotic side and less the agriculture side, agriculture overall right now is about a $3.7 billion industry when we think about food production. Um, but the problem is that agriculture isn't just the food that's produced. There's a lot to the industry all the way from the inputs. So the fertilizer, the land, the water, uh, the equipment that goes into it and all the way through the outputs, the packaging, the shipping, et cetera. And I'll show you the value chain in a little bit. Actually, I'll show you the value chain right now. So as we talked about it, right, there's a lot of different inputs and this input side can be anywhere from around two to $3 billion in, in total, uh, uh, revenue for those companies, right? And then you have the production side, which we just showed, it continues to grow. Um, and then processing and packaging, right? So everything from a small co-op that you would find in, you know, Vermont or, or something like that, all the way to the large companies like uh, Tyson Foods. Um, you have your storage and distribution. So everything from, you know, a small, again, co-op that you could find all the way to a U.S. Foods or a Cisco uh, distributing it. And then 
all the way down to your local farmer's market or large international companies like a McDonald's, right? So it goes all the way through. When you look at the agriculture industry, it's well over 10, sorry, and I was saying billion, well over $10 trillion um, and has been growing at about a 5% CAGR and looks to be continuing to grow at a 5% CAGR. So some of the biggest companies uh, are companies, you know, you don't know as well. They're not as popular, but uh, Archer Daniels Midland, BASF, um, Tyson, we talked about, right? And a lot of different companies as well as, as they continue to go on. So that's kind of just a snapshot of what the agriculture industry looks like. But one way to kind of bring it home is what do we eat? So this is a chart that ends in 2014, but in that year, we ate somewhere in the range of 3 billion uh, animals uh, as a population. And that was about 10 years ago. So that has continued to grow. Um, so if you think about that overall, it's kind of brings it home to what's on your table. And this is another portion of the agriculture industry I haven't mentioned now. Everyone thinks of corn, soy, wheat, but animal husbandry and managing animals is also a big piece. So when we touch the agriculture industry, we just talked about it being a large industry. I, I, we like to call it kind of that the elephant, right? The, the blind people touching the elephant. You know, everyone have, as they touch the elephant are going to describe it differently and have a different view of it and a different understanding of that problem. Where Dan Foss touches it is at the equipment side. And so what we're seeing is, is a large problem with a few things and, and what our OEMs and the farmers are looking for to improve their capabilities is really a lack of experienced labor. If they can find people, those people don't necessarily have experience. They don't necessarily have knowledge or the capability. And that's if they can even find the people. If they can't, it's just a complete lack of labor, right? And a good example of this is about two years ago, I was out not far from where Tyler is in a strawberry field that used to have about 200 workers a year come through and harvest that field and they would go through it twice. Now, this was about two years ago, they only had 50 people that were even available to them. They could not go through the field twice and they left a lot of crop in the field. Overall, I think last year was $3.8 billion of crop was left in the fields in the US and it was a little over $3 billion of crop left in the fields in Canada. So just in North America alone, you're looking at about $7 billion of crop left in the field, either unplanted or unharvested due to a lack of labor or due mainly to a lack of labor. And the last piece that we see is equipment make accidents and safety. Uh, construction is definitely a, a more dangerous industry than agriculture, but agriculture is much larger than construction. So you still see a lot of incidents, deaths, maimings, and things like that on a farm uh, that can be avoided. So the one thing that we look at is we look at er, technology and agriculture and how it's advanced. One of the things is that, you know, when we think about it, rob robotics or autonomy, these aren't really new concepts to agriculture, right? This labor shortage isn't necessarily a new thing. If you look at back in the 1860s, you would have a whole family farming together, right? Everybody from, I think, the, the 10-year-old or 12-year-old down there all the way to the, the next generations. There might be some mechanized help, but overall, it, it was mostly done by, by hand labor. You come to the turn of the century, and this is an early John Deere. It doesn't show up as great on the screen, but... Uh, you know, and you start to get some mechanization now involved. You get fewer people, but it's still pretty labor intensive. Uh, it is still pretty people intensive. Um, and it continues to improve over the years. The problem with that is that the machines were very simple back then. And somebody who operated that combine or operated, that was their life. That was their livelihood. They could make basically a whole living feeding their family and everything off of being a professional equipment operator or off of being a professional farmer or farmhand. Nowadays, that's less true. And what's happened now is a lot of the OEMs have been putting more and more of the technology up into the vehicle. And so this is the seat of a combine for those that aren't familiar. So no steering wheel. So you can get as close to the header as you can. But if you look at overall the, the amount of, I would say, operations that can happen, right? Even that joystick alone, I think we've counted, has something like 14 different uh, selectors and switches on it. And they all switch a display that you can then select a lot of different. If you know how to operate this mean, machine, you are extremely productive. But it takes a long time and a lot of experience to get up to operate that machine. It's not necessarily intuitive on day one. So not having the experienced labor or not having the labor means that you're struggling to find the operators that can really maximize the productivity in the space. And then, you know, I did ask chat GPT or sorry, uh, co-pilot what the robotic farm of the future looks like and, uh, and got this picture out. So I'll let everyone think of that what they may, but, but maybe that's what the future looks like there. But 
when you think about it, really, we talked about the problems. Well, realistically, what we're seeing is a lot of the solutions around technology are, are centering around precision, productivity, and safety. So precision agriculture, being able to plant more precisely, being able to plant to the right depths for the soil, being able to do a lot more of the management. Productivity, we already talked about, being able to be more productive uh, as, you, as you operate, uh, being able to do more with one operator, do more with the, the labor you have. And then safety, maintaining safety around the farm. And so one of the things, again, that's a little bit different between agriculture and between agriculture and automotive. When we think about robotics in agriculture, we think about autonomous vehicles on highway. I hope that people think about the different levels of an autonomous vehicle, right? The, what the SAE defines at that for a car. And realistically, that's not the right way to think about technology and agriculture, especially around the vehicle side. The first three levels are very much the same, where you have basic partial automation and some conditional automation, you know, the advanced cruise control and things like that that you'd normally see. But as we start to move into more advanced vehicles with the operator out of the field, we're really not looking at um, level four the way automotive describes it. We're really looking at how is this going to work for our industry? How does this work at agriculture? And this may be that one operator is in the field monitoring two, three, four vehicles, watching those vehicles become more productive, allowing them to kind of keep that safety watch. So being able to be at least as productive as they were with three people, but now being able to do it with one. And level five automation, leaving the field altogether, realistically, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon with an agriculture because at the end of the day for the harvester or for the farmer, depending on what type of crop you're talking about, that's their livelihood. That's the one time a year when they're planting seed that if they mess that up, it screws them up for years and years and years in terms of debt, in terms of managing their own uh, viability. And the same thing on the harvest side of the season. So level four automation with somebody in the field, somebody managing multiple vehicles is really the way we see the, the industry moving uh, and where we see the industry being at least in the next 20 to 30 years. So I'm going to skip through this just in the interest of time, but... Overall, one of the things that we, we talked about, again, is precision, productivity, and safety. So when we think about precision and productivity, for those that don't know, this is a, a simple vineyard, right? And it's an over-the-crop vehicle. And we deal with a few of these at large vineyards uh, around the world. We deal with one down in New Zealand. That's this exact use case. If they're using an autonomous vehicle, it needs to be just as productive as they were with the spraying and the management of the crop. But at the same time, it has to be just as precise as an operator would be with that crop as well. Because if that vehicle were to clip the cordon, which is the, the trunk of the grape, for lack of a better term, it takes up to eight years to regrow that to maturity, right? And so you're losing out on eight years of productivity from that plant. It's not something that you can regrow tomorrow. I know in the uh, orchard industry, a lot of the tree nuts, you're still looking at that kind of time frame. If you destroy a tree or damage a tree, it's not like you can have a new one planted tomorrow. It takes years and years and years to rebuild it. So that precision and that productivity is necessary to kind of get the yield out of the farm, but also maintain the farm in a good condition. And the last piece is the safety. Our farms are open places. Um, in addition, you have a lot of inexperienced labor, as we talked about, around farms. So being able to use, you know, robotics to, and, and whether you call it autonomous vehicles or robotics, to really improve the overall safety around the farm is something as simple as, being able to look around a corner, being able to detect a blind spot, being able to understand uh, who is in the field with you. And so, again, just to reiterate, one of the things that we're seeing, the way we touch the elephant, the way we approach uh, agriculture right now, is improvements on precision, productivity, and safety. We've been driving that in real-world use cases and trying to get real-world data out of it as we, we continue to work with OEMs on it. And... That is all I have. So I'd like to welcome up for the panel discussion, uh, Katie Stebbins, who's the Executive Director of Food and Nutrition uh, Innovation Institute. Patrick Varley from Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi, uh, Mitsubishi Electric, sorry. Uh, the Product Market Manager for Robotics. Arno Gluschek uh, from McKinsey, who's the Global Director of Strategy and Operations uh, for Chemicals and Agriculture, and AJ Perez, uh, who's the founder of the, founder MD, uh, the uh, Grow Clean Group. Great. 
So we're now on microphone. Do I need them all? Any first? Yeah, okay, sharing. sharing. Yeah. Oh, perfect. All right, awesome. So do about 30 minutes on the panel, and then we'll, we'll try and open it up for question and answer afterwards uh, and give everyone the opportunity to do that. So the first question I want to ask, and just to go around, and, and it's a short 30-minute panel, is really kind of give yourself an introduction, and we'll go, we'll go this way to make it easy. But, you know, we talked about agriculture being that big industry and, and kind of how do you touch the elephant? How do you understand the industry? And, you know, what are some of the things that, that some of the insights that you can kind of give before we get into any of the challenges and opportunities? Okay, okay. we'll start here. Great. Is this, this, I don't know if this is actually working or connected. Is it working? No? It's not. Yep, there we go. Okay. Okay. Thank you for having me. This is really wonderful. Um, so my connection to this. So how many of you, just a show of hands, how many of you eat food? <laughs> oh my God, I'm in a great room. I'm in the room I'm supposed to be in. Fantastic. So my connection to this, I'm Katie Stebbins. mentioned I run the Tufts Food Nutrition Innovation Institute. We're a membership organization that goes across the value chain from farm to fork. With major with CPG companies, nonprofits, and startups, um, and why is it? Why is automation? Why robotics? Why? Why would I be here? So nutrition density, nutrition. Um, where I'm out of the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts, we are the only school of nutrition in the United States, and we care a lot about what goes from farm to plate and making sure that it is the healthiest possible food we could possibly put out there for our consumers. So we look at is what are the consumer trends happening in food, demand for plant-based, demand for nutritional density, demand for clean label, no chemicals, all these different things. And all of that starts, as we know, at the farm. And we know a lot of that also relates back to the technology that we lean into on the farm side. And so whether it's eliminating the dull, dirty, and dangerous out of the labor side, which we know automation can be an incredibly valuable and important part of, or whether it's how do we get food into the ground, out of the ground, into the plate, using automation, technology, sensors, data, um, to make sure that we have the most nutritious, densest food supply chain. Um, that's what we focus on on my council. Cut. Thank you. I'm Patrick Riley. I'm with Mitsubishi Electric Automation. We are the automation group of Mitsubishi Electric, obviously, so the name. Uh, we have a number of different products underneath our umbrella. We have servos, VFDs, uh, PLCs, HMIs, and of course the group that I'm with, Robotics. And we really touch the agriculture industry in many, many places because when you look at whether it's a conveyor or your uh, metering water or other devices, uh, that are being delivered to the plants in the field, that all has to be controlled. And so that's uh, really the, the nuts and bolts that people don't see a lot in the automation industry. And then on the robotic end specifically, we do a lot post-harvest. Uh, we have a lot of applications in the tree nuts industry. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, apple handling. And I think as you said earlier too, um, our equipment in those industries is typically used in very short, but very intense bursts because you only have a certain amount of time to harvest the fruit, to get it packaged, to get it on its way so it's sellable and still fresh. And so that's where we see a lot of our uh, robots being deployed is getting that processing as efficient as possible. And the labor shortages are just you know, destroying this industry, especially when you only need someone for a few weeks. Uh, it's very hard to get them back. If you offer someone year-round employment, that's different. Um, but you just, you never know who's going to show up from day to day. And one of the growth areas that we're seeing for our products are the indoor vertical greenhouses because it's very predictable. You've taken a lot of elements, including the elements of risk, out of it. Uh, we don't have to worry about dust or rain and everything is where we expect it to be. So as an automation company, that's really what we're seeing uh, in the real world applications right now. There's so much under development. Uh, whether it's in gripper technology or uh, we've seen drone technology out there as well, delivering uh, insecticides or monitoring the soil. We're seeing a lot of breakthroughs in those industries that are just now starting to come out. But again, I think, as you said, you've got one shot at planting and one shot at harvesting in a lot of cases. And so that's part of the reason why it's very, very slow to adopt is 
I don't want to be that one that tries it first and it doesn't work or it doesn't work right. So I think once the industry can overcome that and get some success stories, it's really going to take off from there. Auto? Yeah. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, so, Otto Brishek, I'm director of uh, Special and Operations for the Chemicals and Agriculture Practice uh, based out of uh, Chicago. For those that are wondering, my accent is actually Brazilian, so I'm born and raised in, in, in Brazil. I mean, I'm prominent by training agriculture engineer, my whole family uh, coming from, from the field. At the firm, at McKissey, we serve, uh, the way we see the value chain is almost like what Peter uh, just showed, right? So we think about the producer itself, but we think about the ID input sector, which is key with like fertilizer, the prop, uh, protection, seeds, equipment, and so on. And also uh, in the end of the value chain. So the traders, the primary processors, and so on. So the one is spent a lot of time online, so I know we have limited time. So just jumping in a little bit on the topic itself. Um, when I think about robotics, uh, I usually step back a little bit on what's the challenge for agriculture industry. And if you ask people in the industry, the answer will be, well, we need to feed the growing population in a sustainable and cost-efficient way, right? Uh, of course, feed. In a nutritious way. Let's, let's we say healthy, equitable, sustainable. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so basically, the, the way we think about robotics and even automation itself is actually touches all the three pillars, right? So how we increase productivity, and in this case, yield biological productivity. We have many ways of thinking about this. When you think about sustainability, it's a pillar that is growing more and more. And there are many ways where automation can touch this from monitoring the field, from doing traceability to the consumer to the end, or even allowing some type of sustainable solutions that are not uh, available today, right, on a much uh, cost efficient way. And of course, uh, with, uh, with cost and control, right? So when we think about automation, uh, one of the things that keep coming back is the accuracy, is the precision. Actually, if we talk just one piece of, uh, of fact, I think it's important to bring. When you ask farmers today, and we do this, we interview like 5,000 farmers per year, uh, one of the questions is, why do you do and what's your biggest motivation for automation today? Of course, the labor topics are there, but the top one is actually accuracy and, and precision, uh, which means basically that they are thinking, well, I'm going to be more precise, more accurate, so I'm going to use less inputs and I'm going to have more productivity. So again, labor is also very important. It's a short-term solution that we need, but I think robotics touches all the three pillars on the challenges that you've had for agriculture today. Thank you. Yeah. Hey everyone. My name is AJ Perez. I'm the founder of Grow Clean Capital. I represent sort of a different view on the industry here. Uh, we buy distressed farms and convert them to regenerative organic. So we are in the seat of commercial real estate holders. We represent the interests of the land for the long term, not the land for this year, this season, this harvest. So when we think about automation, when we think about technology adoption, robotics in this industry, it's always a question of what's the long term return and how do we motivate the farmers to take short term risks for that long term benefit. If there are specific questions, I'll dig into it more, but that's kind of my context here on the panel for myself personally. I have three degrees in mechanical engineering from MIT, so come from the robotics side of the house after a couple of startup stories uh, ended up in the agricultural land ownership side of the equation. So I'm actually going to start with you, AJ, then. So, so as you look kind of back at, uh, you know, especially from the land side and, and having a lot of your, your um tenants be farmers and, and understanding that and, and based on your goals, you know, what are some of the opportunities that you see, you know, obviously for robotics automation in agriculture, but also kind of more broadly in agriculture for technology to kind of improve those, those goals that you were talking about? It's a fantastic question. Where, where, where's the low hanging fruit? Um, I had a good friend, co-founder of mine who went to Harvard business school used to say, use the analogy for startups. And this is kind of advice to entrepreneurs here. If you're not a tree, like thinking using a hospital analogy, if you're going into the hospital for triage and all you need is a band-aid, you're like a one or a two on their scale. 
you need to focus on problems which are like an eight or a nine or a 10 and just like immediate obvious flare-ups of issues. And where I like to look for low-hanging fruit opportunistically is what's mandated by the government that is annoying as heck for the farmers to have to deal with and comply with. So a lot of the reporting of how much of certain liquids that they're using, either pulling out of the ground or spraying onto the crops. You are taking a big thorn out of the paw of the farmer if you can solve that problem. And whether it's a robotics monitoring solution, how you slice the technology and end up implementing it, problems like that that are legislated in for literally every single farmer to comply with, you have a captive audience that if they want to stay in the business, they have to either do it the manual way or do it in the better way. That's where I see some really obvious low-hanging fruit. Anything outside of that is sort of, you know, should I buy the new car or should I not in terms of decision for the farmer to go and buy the new piece of equipment or upgrade their motor or add that new attachment. Those are kind of, it's always that same question of, well, if my car's broken down, I need the replacement. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's always the thing in the back of people's minds. But if it's one of these things that they got to do every year for the government or multiple times a month for the government, and you can automate that problem away for them, you have a very uh, open audience. It's awesome. It's, yeah. And I'm going to jump into you, and, and you have the interesting experience of seeing the whole value chain operations from, you know, all the way from the input side, all the way through to the, the packaging and, and the output side. Um, I guess one of the questions I have for you is, is, is anybody doing it well in terms of capturing those opportunities that are, that are in the value chain or, or are there places where you think there's bigger opportunity? Uh, for technology, automation, robotics, whatever it may be? I think, I think it depends on how you look at the size of the opportunity, right? So um, I think there are uh, specific use cases that people are starting to capture uh, things. And usually those use cases are, we can call the low-hanging fruits, but uh, those are the ones that have the higher ROI with the technology available, right? So if you think about the the evolution, and, and there's some data on, on, on adoption on each of them, right? So if you think about the evolution of uh, monitoring of the field, if you think about five to 10 years ago, you wouldn't imagine a drone flying over your field, taking photos of your orchard and saying, well, this plant is healthy, this plant is not health. So let, let, let's do something about this. And this is happening. And you see many, many cases where you're actually transforming this into value, right? And that's what I would tell the success and capturing value. Now, this is for one specific use case, a low hanging fruit. But I think when you think about the, the vision, right? And uh, now I'm gonna step many years forward. When we think about robotics, uh, we can always think on a short term, the incremental gains that we're talking about. So reducing a little bit the, the inputs use, uh, substitute some labor and so on and so forth. But you can also think, how do you disrupt the, the way technology uh, agriculture is, is run, right? So for, for, for that one, I would step back a little bit. And when we think about agriculture today is massive tractors that do everything at scale. Actually, agriculture has been built on that way, right? When we think about grain farmers, uh, they are using massive tractors with uh, sprays and chemicals that go all around, kill all of the weeds. Uh, and the same thing, when we think about genetics of plants, they were developed to be harvested uh, at the same time, because you only have one specific window to go to the field, do your job, and leave uh, as soon as possible. Now, if you think on how you can twist this with a 24-7, with your Gen AI photo of robots going around the field, uh, and actually you don't need to have this at scale. You can actually treat plant by plant to the full potential, right? This would increase the productivity, not only by 20%, 30%, but a uh, plant of corn has potential to produce three times, four times what they produce today if you're able to treat that specific plant on the right way at the right moment uh, with the right product. So when we think about this vision on the amount of value that you can create with this, uh, we are really far from anything on capturing close to, to, to where the value is. And out of curiosity, I know you and I talked about it a little bit uh, earlier, but you know, do you think that'll be a, a step change or do you think that'll be generation after generation after generation to kind of, again, you get the smaller tractor and then you get two of them, then you get the smaller again, you get three or do you think that'll be a, a step change or a, a progressive change? Yeah, I think definitely a, a step change, right? It's hard for you to, to go to any investor or anybody with money today and share uh, the, the pitch that I just gave and saying, hey, don't worry, 
20 years, 30 years from now, you're going to get your money back, right? So uh, in, in the journey, there's uh, plenty of value to be captured when we get there, right? So we probably start with the, what, what the farmer is doing today. So you have tractors, you adapt tractors, you put sensors there, uh, you change the way a little bit you do, right? Uh, when you have some autonomous solutions, you do it, you probably don't, don't have these small robots, but again, you use what the farmers have today. So you incrementally start getting value uh, out of this. Um, so yeah, so incremental, you, you wouldn't disrupt the whole thing from day to night. Actually, you need a technology advancement and so on and so forth. Great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think part of the tools, we definitely need more patient capital in the system to make this innovation go forward. And so, you know, I think about, I mean, I can, I'm in academia, you know, what is the role of research? What is the role of SBIR? What's the role of, of government research, et cetera? Because this transformation is like, it's urgent. How we're going to feed the next 2 billion people on the planet equitably, healthy, sustainably is, is now. And so there's a, there's a multi-generational, we need to do this, but there's also an, an urgency in this that's pretty urgent. Um, and we need some solid sources of patient capital into that system quickly to make sure we can run these experiments and pilots and prove out the use cases. Completely agree. So I guess I was going to come to you. Do you want to kind of touch on any, I mean, that was kind of one opportunity that you see, but are there other opportunities from your kind of space that you see beyond just the patient capital uh, that you want to kind of touch on? Yeah. I mean, you know, we'll like to say there's going to be, I don't want to say it's post agricultural economy, although that phrase does get used a lot in our walls, but at some point, part of your food will come out of the ground and see, part of it will come out of indoors and part of it will come out of a lab. And how automation plays into that and how we maximize each of those scenarios is, is really interesting. And what are, we ma- what are we optimizing for? And so I think when we were optimizing at one point in the industrial revolution for calories and for output to just simply get people the calories they need to live, that was one thing. But now that the focus is shifting, we want people to have, we want them to have nutrient dense, cal- dense calories and we want them to be toxin free. And so how do we achieve that goal? And how do we do it at cost? I mean, I just came from Future Food Tech in San Francisco. You know, the challenge is how do we do this with price parity? How do we bring it to a cost where we know consumers still shop on taste and price first? They shop on sustainability and all the fun bells and whistles last. And so at some point, we've got to figure out how to create cost competitiveness and build the use cases so that we can accelerate. Um, because the technology is there. It's frustrating to not be able to to build a consumer market immediately at a cost where people are just running for it, even though we know it has to happen. And so um, I do think we'll have a point where I might have a front of pack label on my carrots that compares the, we talked about this, the soil quality of, of one of one farm versus another farm. Um, the nutrition density, there's a startup out of Marlboro called Audacious, and they're on a mission to make sure that farmers can track and report on nutrition density in the field in a low cost way. And that's, I think, MIT technology, mass spec technology that came out of there. And so those type of innovations are going to allow this transparency and drive the consumer to demand more and to want more. I also just finally, had my, I was saying earlier, in the, uh, before I had my husband's in the cannabis industry, uh, he's a regulator here in Massachusetts. And it's an interesting industry to watch for ag tech because, um, you know, they tag and, and they tag every plant. And they, and they know every plant and the industry from its growth to its consumption and where it goes and what it does, the values, the chemical values in it. It's a really intense industry in terms of about tracking these plants. And I think it's one that um, anyone in the innovation space should be looking, because they have such strict government regulations, they've really had to innovate in interesting ways. It's a, fa- it's a really interesting agricultural use case. Great, thank you. And Patrick, I think going to you more on the indoor farming side, you know, do you see opportunities there, kind of especially pivoting off of what uh, Otto and uh, Kitty both said? Absolutely. The indoor farming industry, is, I think, is going to be growing very quickly in the future because you're solving a number of problems. You're growing the crops to be mature when you need them. Because it's indoor and you're controlling the lighting, the temperature, the watering, et cetera, you can stagger your crops. So if you look at, you know, I'm from upstate New York, uh, you look at our apple crop. They all get ripe within a certain period of time. And if you want a fresh apple in March, it was likely grown last year. But the indoor greenhouses, especially with the vertical farming, you could time things so that you have uh, fresh produce when you want it, but also you can have it near the consumer. 
and that's really one of the, the important uh, features of vertical farming is that it is practically on demand, obviously, with a little lead time and where you need it to be. One of the challenges is urban areas aren't known for having a lot of farm history. And so that's where the automation really kicks in. And when you think about it, the, the hardest thing for automating agriculture is the downtime for the automation. If you're using it to harvest, well, it's not being used as much during the growth season. But with the indoor, you could be running literally a 24-7, 12-month operation with different products at different stages. And most importantly, if you're collecting on a database similar to what you mentioned, um, you would know when each seed was planted, how much water it got. And then uh, you are also solving one of the main challenges for the indoor greenhouses, which is the introduction of pests and blight and things like that. Because people, when they're working inside those, it almost looks like they're in a semiconductor facility. They're wearing the bunny suits and they're trying to keep the hazards out because then you don't have to hit them with pesticides and you don't have to introduce those chemicals to your worker. And a robot is ideal for it because once you have it in that environment, it's not going to be introducing any pests or any issues like that. So, you know, we see a, a lot of growth and a lot of potential in that industry as well. I guess pivoting away from the growth side, but now to the, the challenges side of that industry, you know, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing on why it isn't going faster or why it isn't, isn't growing as quickly as you think it should? I think the upfront investment is what scares a lot of people because you can't just build a greenhouse and say it's now a vertical farm. There's a lot that goes into the planning of it, uh, from the scaling to making sure you have the equipment. And, you know, that part of the industry, obviously, there have been greenhouses practically forever. But the whole vertical farming on cue, so to speak, is relatively new. And I think people are still feeling their way through it. And, you know, let's face it, um, it made news when Trader Joe's raised bananas from 19 cents to 23 cents. There's not a lot of margin in some of this. And so to spend one, two, three million, you have to know you're going to get that payback because in the industrial robot market, you know, one of the things that we, we have to recognize as suppliers is nobody wants to buy a robot. Nobody comes to me and says, Patrick, I want a robot. They have a problem. They want to go away and they may feel a robot's the best way of doing that. And really with the farmer's, uh, in the traditional farming areas, running at full tilt, the last thing on their mind is let me move to the city and build a vertical greenhouse. So you have to get new people and new capital into the market in order to make these really uh, blossom, so to speak. And I know, Otto, you and I had talked previously about capital, and I think you'd said it was last year, the year before was the first year that startup funding in, in ag tech in general had ever exceeded what the top uh, R&D spend was from the, the top companies. Um, so there clearly is some investment starting to come into the industry at a, at a healthy level, but do you see that as still a big challenge in terms of getting out or do you see some other challenges within the industry? Yeah, I think, I think we discussed a little bit about the capital and then the, the question is who is actually innovating. And I think we discussed a little bit about this as well, right? Is it shapers? Is it the, the patient uh, capital or is it the the traditional ones, uh, and indeed that, that, that's the number, right? The curious number, even before a little bit on the capital drop, I think many of us are, are experienced this, but the fact is in 2021, if you look at the shapers, or what we call the shapers, the ag tech investment was higher than what's the R and D for the top 15 companies uh, in the agriculture world, which is, is, is great to hear, right? So a lot of money is going to innovation in, in, in ag tech. Now, if we think about the unlocks, I think there are many, and uh, I like to say not challenges, but unlocks for, for, for the industry, right? Because as we see them uh, happening, uh, we see the, the implementation and the value capture happen. So the first one, of course, that there is the technological piece, right? And that for, for many use cases, uh, you need specific technology to evolve. We were discussing about vision, we we're discussing about ripping or uh, connectivity in the farms. Uh, or even when you think about energy, right? So this idea on running 24 seven, you need energy and you don't have docking stations across the fields everywhere, right? So uh, there is the technology uh, component. Uh, the second thing is how we think about agriculture. Uh, we usually say, well, this is agriculture, but when you think about uh, the sector itself, you actually have so many different crops. 
in so many different regions, with so many different soils, with so many different practices that you need to do in the field. And each farmer has this different, right? So uh, I think the complexity that you get there, when you have one solution, uh, the size of that solution, it's not necessarily big enough uh, to, to justify the investment. So we go back to the uh, our wide return on investment question, which is it's difficult for you to scale in agriculture. So we need to think on how we can actually, with few solutions, tackle many problems uh, that the farmers have. Otherwise, it, 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 it will be difficult, right? Uh, and the, th the third and lock is probably go to market. Uh, again, another topic we, we, we were discussing, right? The, this unique um, characteristic, let's say, of the farmers make it difficult to, to reach out. When you think about automation in manufacturing, you probably have five, 10 big players that run similar processes to produce similar things. But when you talk about thousands of different farmers with different problems in different places, uh, it's... Uh, it's a unique type of client for you to reach out and each one has its own specific problem. So there are some solutions again, right? I mean, you asked about the unlocks, so I'm sharing the unlocks. Yeah. We can always discuss what are the solutions for those, but those are probably the top of mind on saying, how do we make this scale and go beyond where we are right now? Yep, absolutely. And yeah, I think the solutions is, uh, is something we can touch on at the end or during questions, but it's, it's nice to get the challenges or the unlocks out there. Let's start using that unlocks instead of challenges. So. I'm going to go, I guess, uh, Katie, to you next in terms of, you know, from, from where you sit, you know, looking at the nutrition side and, and really trying to understand how do we feed that next 2 billion people? Obviously that's, that's a large challenge, but if you were to break that down, are there other kind of challenges or, or I would say overcomable unlocks that you see in the, in the industry that, that you think are kind of the best ones for, uh, that are, sorry, that are preventing, uh, movement forward? So it was interesting. I'm thinking about government, which one of you said, you said government, go to where the government is. Um, so the dietary guidelines are being debated right now and they'll be published in 2025. We don't think they will include sustainability, but we do think that the next version of the dietary guidelines for Americans will, the DGAs. And so if they do include sustainability, then that pressure is going to go down to the farm level, right? How do we, and that is going to include labor. So we talk about sustainability now. We don't just talk about environmental sustainability. Sustainability is about equity. It is about labor. And in fact, labor is having a moment. I mean, what's very interesting right now is in this country, if you're watching, labor is having a very interesting moment. And whether it's farm labor that's happening at farms that was on those lately, whether it's unionization of different companies, food companies, et cetera, this is going to continue. We don't see this dropping. And so all these little pieces are going to be moments that press into, again, a need for innovation. And so what I think is important is looking at the full system um, and developing some smart use cases against it. I think it's about putting people in the ring with you that aren't necessarily just the farmer, but also the CPG company, also the retailer, or also um, the doctor who's now prescribing food as medicine. And so, or like a a bioactives company that has to deliver on the promise of a bioactive. And so I think part of this is about putting rooms together that represent, um, I love what you were talking about here with all the different parts that you cover, like precision nutrition is something that we're going to be doubling down on because everybody's collecting all their biomarkers on a watch. About 95% of you are all tracking all your biomarkers on your wearables at any given time. That's going to translate into, now you're going to have a continuous glucose monitor on your watch and a hydration monitor on your watch, and then other little things measuring everything about your body growing out in the next five years, and your phone's going to go like, you need this, you need this, you need this, you don't need that, right? Where does that translate into? That's going to translate into, wait a minute, I need this, I don't need that, I want that, I don't want that. So personalization of fruit and what the consumer's demanding is moving, I think, at a, at a decent clip, and how that translates into these use cases is interesting. So I just think some of it's about making sure that we're putting reverse rooms together to consider the innovation we need and the use cases we need so that it works for the entire, the entire value chain and ultimately the consumer who's going to have to demand the product coming off the fork. Yeah, thank you. I guess, AJ, just touching on you and, and then we'll go to the Q&A, but, um, you know, you talked about kind of those low-hanging fruit opportunities that, that are there, that you know that the farmers need and the farmers that you talk to need. But I guess what are some of the barriers to them 
adopting some of the the technologies, whether it be robotics, automation, or other things, to getting them to want to adopt those things to get them to want to then be able to tackle those those low hanging fruit. I like the answer in threes, but I think there's an even shorter, the shortest version of this is going to come down to trust. And there's a lot of distrust between farmers and technology providers. Uh, I don't know if you follow the labor side, the right to repair this, there's a huge set of issues between farmers and their equipment providers. Mm -hmm. And the further they go towards digitalization, the further it's out of the hands of the mechanic farmer, the more terrified they are and distrustful by nature of that technological system so i don't know if that's as simple as spare parts at the local boda dealer the tractor supply that are very common for the boards that are going to fry on those things when they get wet because they're just worried the thing is down and they got to repair it or they got to wait in line for the i have no control over the pricing mercedes experience when they want more of the do-it-myself uh model t experience mm -hmm. in a lot of cases because what you're asking them to do is to trust their entire livelihood on some robotic gizmo for some device. And they have to trust that. And their trust, but verify, the verify is I got to be able to repair it myself or fix it myself or deal with it myself or deal without it myself. So it's something that I always just try to keep in the back of my mind. Uh, and then just advice to the entrepreneurs here that are thinking about this segment. You got to build a business. It's not sufficient to just dump a bunch of technology that's going to break. You have to have customers that are going to keep coming back, say good things, spread by word of mouth, and more talk more and more and more. The farmers are tough to get in front of. I have a kind of captive audience because most farmers are looking to expand their businesses unless they're on the twilight end of their career. And we have land, so there's a natural dialogue to always have. It's, but it is difficult to get in front of them and build that trust and build that rapport. So we found that as the landowner where we can invest in where there's maybe shared responsibility between the tenant farmer and the landowner. So for example, with water, we're both legally responsible as far as water permits are go for reporting how much water is used on a property. We both share the responsibility. We both have a vested interest in the solution. That can be a double-edged sword. If you need two people to agree on a sale, that can be tough, but it, you can also look at it the other way. You have two interested parties, either of which could make a decision to buy something like that. So I would look at and maybe try and focus on those types of opportunities if you're trying to uh, break into this market. But again, going back to that one word answer to it all, it comes down to trust. Guy, can I add on to that too? We'll have a startup on our council uh, It's a tough spin out. And you talked about machinery sort of sitting when it's not picking and, and working. Uh, and it's a SaaS model. And so basically they just arrive when you need it and and then they leave and go to the next farm. And so I think that's also an interesting piece in this, which is because when you're talking about trusting, I'm like, well, I don't have to fix it, trust it, own it. I can hire the service, have it come do what I need it to do. It's their problem if it breaks or not. Um, it's on them to make sure it works. But I think that that um, on-demand model is kind of interesting. Yeah, and we, we've seen some of that. I think the risk we've always seen with, with some of those models is what happens when they're overbooked. What happens when it rains on the day? And, and, yep. you know, again, that livelihood comes back to it. And when one other thing I'd, I'd like to point out, AJ, is we, you know, one of the most interesting things we see is companies are trying to understand agriculture, construction, or any, any of the, the off-road industries is there's a level of ruggedization. Um, there's a level of food safety. Every vehicle gets power washed down. I mean, these are not well-treated components. You can't take your computer or you know, some industrial NVIDIA box you just bought on Amazon and put it into the vehicle. These are, these are vehicles that get beat up and, and, and roughed around a lot and things break. And so it is something that immediately from the very beginning, you have to understand in, in the field, things break and, and how do you deal with that? So I, I like that, but I know we had a short amount of time for the panel. So I, I do want to jump right into Q and A. So we have about 15 minutes for any Q and A that anybody has, uh, in the group. If there's no Q, there will be air. <laughs> I have my like, closer on. Who's going to be the lucky first? There we go. Yeah. Hi, I'm a researcher at Northeastern. So I think it's related to the trust problem. I know that USDA services centers, they sometimes have workshops to introduce farmers about the new technologies. 
Do you think that's enough effort or do you see there are more opportunities, you know, from institutions or governments or whatever other than startups can do for kind of trust? I don't know about you, how I look at it. When the government's recommending a certain service provider, I don't know that I trust that service provider necessarily. So I think the community driven approaches, things that are driven by farmers for farmers, as opposed to government out approaches might be the best way to go. Um, those, I found them, the government programs to be double-edged sword. You know, sometimes when you're, when you have a problem and you're like, I need a vendor to do this. So like, sorry, we can't recommend anyone because we have to, you know, for non-competitiveness reasons and things like that, for openness and fairness, um, to not be in the position of recommending one business or another. So their hands are kind of tied. So they're sort of useless in that way in terms of like actually helping business. And then when they do introduce people to come in, it's sort of self-serving companies that that's sort of how the audience reads it. It's a distrustful environment. You see a lot of crossed arms at those events from farmers. You read the body language. So I don't know that that solves the problem, but I see those types of things as issues when it's kind of government to farmer and where you have more success is when it's farmer to farmer or within the ecosystem. It's perceived that way. So we're, Startups and tech companies can, you just have to, you have to be there and look like a farmer and talk like farmers. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not something you can do as like a, a journeyman visitor. If, if you kind of are one of these companies, it's like, oh, I've got this tech for factories and farms. I mean, your business is kind of disjoint, honestly. And you're going to have very different personas and personalities. Like those are just very different cultures to build. I've been in both industries and they are nothing alike. Other than the fact that they're risk averse and inherently distrust everyone. That's the similarity. And one of the things that we see, whether it's in agriculture or any other industry, is that seeing a colleague or someone that's in your position have success is really the best advertisement because me telling you how wonderful my products are, you know, in part is my job, but you want to see what it did for him or her. And so I think that uh, maybe in addition to some of the government or some of the trade organizations, I think really getting out there and promoting via case studies or, you know, you, I don't want to say user testimonials, but, you know, that really shows people this is what worked for me and this is why. All on the farm. Yeah. yeah and, and just complement it to that, I think I agree with that 99% of what you said. Followed up another percent. I'm it is. Basically, I would say risk offers. I wouldn't say farm and farmers risk farmers, but it's risk offers where it can be risk offers, right? So if you think about a farmer, the amount of risks it's exposed in terms of think of prices, commodity prices, uh, weather, and so on and so forth, they are so exposed to so many risks that they cannot bear an additional one just because uh, your machine uh, may great increase. So I think the question they will ask is, uh, what if? Right. So what is this brace? If he loses anything, well, that, that, that's the answer is already there. Right. So either you do something that doesn't break at all, uh, or you ensure you have the plan B, which won't disrupt what this to me, because she doesn't want to run an additional risk from all the list of AP already being exposed to. Agreed. You're right. I swipe the most risk of anybody. They saw more. <clears throat> than the one. Hello. Uh, so uh, my name is Richard Flynn. So uh, we are building automatic insight monitor for farmers. So um, we we do have a very strong like a like a eco for the trust that part, but it's more for the, like a sales part. So what's your what's your perspective regarding to the like a sales channel? Uh, this is most critical part for selling to the farmers and from your experience, uh, what kind of way is working better, uh, then right now we are doing this more like a word of mouth. Uh, so try to understand how can be more productive. Yeah. I mean, to me, I think your question almost answers itself. Um, the person supplying the next level of automation or technology has to be someone that they trust and the people that they trust with their decisions of equipment and techniques 
of people they're buying from today. So it really makes it difficult to break in uh, as a new technology with their trusted advisors because with uh, harvesting, you know, I have my 2024 harvest. And if I made any mistake, I have to wait a year to try to undo those. And again, if I'm selling equipment to, to 10 farmers and I'm doing very well, coming back to the risk word, how tentative am I going to be to say, you know what? I want to take my customers and take them to that next level. Well, I hope we're ready for it, but here it is. So I think it has to come from trusted advisors and people that they're used to dealing with. Um, and that's, that's a difficult uh, person to get brought up on the technology. I think one thing I would add there too is, is take a look at other technologies like yours that have sold out into the industry, right? So you can see, you know, great use cases, how Tremble and Raven, you know, went and sold their GPS auto guide out and how they got farmers to trust that, how they built up the GPS auto guide industry, how they built their dealer network and, and how they were able to roll that out on both an aftermarket and an OEM solution, right? And so they were able to kind of do that in both ways. But there's a lot of different other companies that have kind of rolled out different solutions in different ways. There's a lot of, like we said, over 10 trillion in terms of overall market. There's a lot of channels into the market and one channel, it's not, you know, as simple as like a consumer channel or something like that. There's a lot of different ways that you can interact uh, with the industry and, and really you got to kind of find that product market fit and find that right channel for you to be able to acquire that customer. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add there. Oh, yeah, next question. Yeah, I wonder if you had any thoughts about situations where you have a technology that will kind of work in the existing workflow, but really needs to have changes, higher level changes in the way they do things in order for it to be really successful. How do you get, how do you get farmers to get to that point where they start thinking about you know, those multipliers? Again, I'm holding the mic, so I guess I can go first. Um, you really have to be solving a problem. And unfortunately with, with a lot of applications, whether it's agriculture or anything with automation, really, really good isn't often good enough, you know? And so taking it that last little bit, there's really no guarantee that what you have hasn't plateaued. So I think that's in a very precarious position because you're, you're almost there and you're generating the interest. But if a year later you're still in the same spot, now that works against you. So uh, I think you really have to develop it to the point where you have that full solution that you've vetted from top to bottom to top in this case. And I would just add on that. I mean, Tom, Bryden, I don't know where you are, but we had this conversation recently about where are the farms to experiment on? Where are the farms to test that, that solution at scale? And I think about some of our land grant universities. I think about, you know, I, we were, I was just talking to Mississippi R1 universities yesterday. You know, they've got a whole bunch of stuff that they want to do in ag and innovation. We, we need large, it's just like with autonomous vehicles, you know, Michigan's like, we're going to build a test track so that we can prove this out. I think we need better, better test cases. We can't just ask the farmer down the street to give us their farm for three years and test something out. I think we need better large scale test farms. And what does that look like? And what do those innovation sandboxes look like um, so that we can build that trust? Great. I think we have time for one more here. All right, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity and being the last one. Uh, so I have a specific question to providers over here, the equipment providers, so Mitsubishi and Dan Foss, but I know you all are tangentially related to this area by research, so maybe it kind of applies to your areas too. What are the things that you are not doing well today so that these startups can disrupt you and that you want to work with them? Uh, let's talk about those. From a manufacturer's perspective or a vendor's perspective. No, I could not use what we think. So is Jamie. Let me your heart. This be recorded. Yeah. And we need. For a large company like ourselves, it takes a lot of momentum to get us moving in a direction. And to see the need for us to change direction or go on a new one, uh, it takes a lot of pre-planning 
and a lot of validation steps. And that's where startups are typically nimble and they can move much faster. And a lot of them by their nature, they're using younger and younger engineers who have experience with different tools than people of my generation do. So to get a company like Mitsubishi to move towards a market, we have to see the opportunity and know that we can address that opportunity in a timely manner before we start to develop it. And again, I think that's where the startup community benefits us and why we work with organizations like Mass Robotics because people are closer to the, the cutting edge than we are. And once we understand, boy, that really could work with us, that's when we get even deeper involved and stay very interested. So I'd say from the Danpros perspective, we, we asked ourselves that question about three and a half years ago. And that's why we, our autonomy team, our business for autonomy is actually completely segmented off uh, both financially from the business in terms of, you know, in a downturn, they, there's no cuts in capital or things like that. But also we have the freedom to make a lot of our own partnerships, the freedom to develop our own technology, test as we need to. I would say our one constraint is, is you know, it's a nice part of being a big company, but it's also a constraint to it is the products we release have to be to that standard and have to agree to the warranties and liabilities. So it's harder for us to iterate a thousand times like like a lot of startups can to kind of fail and go back is, is uh, you know, we joke about this in the mining industry. I can't mess up a cat vehicle, uh, a, a, you know, 340 ton cat mining truck, because then if Dan Foss loses X numbers of hundreds of millions of business with Caterpillar, that's a problem. So, so we do have some constraints and there's some areas that we can absolutely lose out to. And I think that's where you have a lot of freedom. Um, that being said, one advantage to being in a big industry is especially in a place where brands and trust is, if you open up almost any tractor out in an agriculture field, you're going to see Danfoss components. You're going to see Mitsubishi components in almost any food packing plant. So people understand that. And, and do, there is a brand trust level that we do get a benefit of, but we do have that, that disadvantage as well. And we have to protect that. Yep. That we know. Yes. Is you get too many noticeable failures and all of a sudden seeing that logo inside doesn't mean what it meant yesterday. Yep. Exactly. Anybody else want to answer that one before we come on? Great. Well, thank you very much to our panel and to everybody and uh, we'll be around up it. Great teaming up. So Tyler's the CEO and co-founder of Onzai Robotics. Uh, he has deep expertise in robotics and agriculture, uh, and he's led the charge in kind of developing innovative vision-based uh, set to spraying and autonomous solutions, Notab notably during his time at Blue River Technology and John Deere. Uh, at Onzai Robotics, Tyler's dedication to crafting autonomous solutions uh, for the most challenging environments highlights his unwavering commitment to pushing the boundaries of precision agriculture. Thanks. Oh. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. And uh, shout out to Peter and the Mass Robotics community. Very excited to be here all the way from California. So, oops, wrong way. Okay. So, yeah, I did a quick intro. Um, Peter already someone gave it, but, you know, I had no connection to ag and I've been in ag my whole career. And kind of going back to the plant by plant technology side of things, one thing that's been so intriguing to me this whole journey is that. There's these competition corn grows in the Midwest where there's an acre of corn and you grow it, right? And a grower is doing plant by plant treatment and giving the nutrients that the individual plants need on an individual basis can 3x the yields versus traditional, right? It just shows how much room and improvements there are for robotics in this space. So very excited about where I'm at um, and, and where Bonsai's at. And I'm going to give you a quick story about my background and some of the lessons I learned along the career before getting into Bonsai Robotics. So my first job right out of school was at OMC. It was like a startup without equity. We worked super hard and like first project I had was three months to design, design an elevator that was already sold. It's like this 15,000 pound machine, you know, mechanical componentry, electric componentry. And it really kind of set this tone of my career about being engulfed in chaos and just like trying to get wings on airplanes as it's falling out of the sky. Um, and I love it. And I think that's like the beauty of startups and you know, pushing technology to the next sector and being uh, able to take on risk. So in uh, my three-year career there, I got to build, you know, a bunch of conveyor elevators, a uh, random project, but 6,000 horsepower tractor pull tractor. 
which was really fun. And then it really started my journey into autonomy and automation. I started using Dan Foss Plus One and built this first automated tree shaker. So a tree shaker actually shakes the nuts off almonds, walnuts, pistachio. That's how you harvest. It's a pretty weird machine. Generates about 50 Gs of force on the tree trunk. So each limb goes through its natural frequency. I really created this journey into my, my career. Um, we definitely sold products before they were designed and built. And I uh, shipped early and got a lot of customer feedback along that journey. So it was a, a huge learning and discovery period for me. After that, I joined Blue River. And uh, this was a amazing next step in the journey where I started getting into computer vision and the uh, robotic systems associated with it. So when I joined, this first machine was a lettuce thinner. It had 20 and dust big, 20 consumer grade desktop PCs on a machine. It was like the ultimate debugging nightmare for agriculture. It always broke, but it was a truly revolutionizing product, right? Which a lot of this seed and spray and plant by te plant technology is based on. It took 40 people out of a field with one operator driving this machine. And then, uh, you know, that was pre GPU days, right? So traditional computer vision. When the GPU came out, we quickly pivoted and got the first NVIDIA TX1 and it started doing, being able to identify green on green technology. So differentiating crops from weeds. And we built a lettuce weeding machine. The project existed for a week before we threw it away and went straight to building the next phase, this cotton weeding machine, which was really like the, the start of big ag precision green on green spraying. And uh, I remember this day, this, this cotton weeding machine video right here, but this is like 95% reduction in herbicide, right? It's huge and such an impactful thing in the cotton corn and so it, uh, industry. And then, you know, it went to production. So after that, we uh, were acquired by John Deere in 2017. And this was an amazing opportunity. John Deere bought us but kept us separate. Um, and we were treated like a startup. We kind of had a, like a goalie blocker who would let, get us information but kept John Deere out um, just for the, the, the start. And we spun off and started this new venture division, which turned into that autonomous tractor division. So I got to architect and build the very first autonomous tractor for John Deere, which was the zero to one, and then really see how a massive, you know, company that's very good at scaling went from one to end and really turned that into the production design. So, uh, amazing opportunity and, uh, you know, learned a ton there, but we were able to iterate very quickly and, uh, you know, turn it into production ultimately. So now I'm, I'm going to jump into my current company, Bonsai Robotics. We, uh, I, I jumped ship back in 2022 and, uh, I was actually going after something completely different. We were doing yield monitoring up front. So doing yield forecasting and estimation. But I just saw this big gap ultimately in the, you know, tree nut space, but specifically with these mid and smaller OVMs where they, they were never going to have an autonomy team. But there's a huge value add in, in a production opportunity to provide autonomous systems. So we build vision-based autonomy systems. We consider ourselves a capitally light robotics company. We don't build the hardware. We partner with existing manufacturers and just provide the, the vision-based and robotic stack and telemetry. telemetry. So we have uh, um, headquarters in San Jose. We have an 800-acre test farm out in Davis. We're at 24 people right now and have a unique blend of agriculture, and, uh, you know, Silicon Valley startup companies. So really, really interesting ta tech and, uh, you know, I have a pretty awesome opportunity with a lot of machines on order right now and a lot of deliver deliverables. This is actually one of our new shakers. So this shaker in these, this video isn't just autonomous, but it actually two to three X is the speed of operation. And when you look at CapEx and OpEx and the ROI to the grower, right, it's a, a huge impact. So we really target our initial applications that can give about a 45% ROI to the grower. And uh, we started with orchards, right? Big open field of agriculture. There's generally clear, clear GPS. You can have a global path plan, translate that to local. Then this uh, see and stop system, ultimately with the vision stack. So if you see an obstacle, you stop, you alert a, an operator, you can rat around around it. Orchards are challenging. There's generally limited or bad GPS signal, right? You don't get an RTK fix in big orchards. There's dust, debris, you know, high vibrations, which can be uh, limiting the existing perception systems. Um, there's this big opportunity, right? The labor cost per acre in an orchard is about 30X open field ag. 
to roughly $600 per acre. And the precision ag evolution really never took off in the tree crop space. There's no GPS auto steer. There's no variable rate spraying. There's no yield maps. All these things that are huge, huge and high impact opportunities never took off because the limited GPS. So we went after orchards. And uh, this is over solution. So let me get the video to go. Oh, there's sound. Oh, I got it. Um, yeah. So one thing that's different about us is we provide monocular cameras integrated onto a machine, our telemetry app, and then our compute platform, right? So it's a low cost, high performing solution. And we've really constructed the stack to work in conditions that are, are targeted to an orchard. So in this video, you see a couple different applications, but our tree shakers working in dust, this is a sweeper. And then this is a sprayer ultimately. So our stack's easily adoptable. To, to platforms, especially when they have damp fast componentry on them, um, to make things go fast and quick. Um, so it's been pretty exciting. These are some of my partners. The first two are OEMs we work with and then some other folks. And uh, the big thing in how we work that's different, I kind of got into it, was you really built the perception stack based off biology principles. So instead of using like stereo vision and semi-global matching algorithms and starting in the 3D space, we start in 2D, right? And actually know what the environment is around us and then use our slam stack and the whole front end of the slam stack is coming from the deep learning model to actually recreate that world around us and then localize ourselves in it. This gives us the accuracy we need inside the row for local navigation and also enables us to work in these adverse conditions, right? So in the dust you saw in the previous video in the debris, you know, it's huge. We also have the contextual understanding to really know the difference of things in the row. So if there's a telephone pole versus a tree, you know, we don't want to shake telephone poles. It, it's not a, not a pretty sight. Um, so it enables us really to build this high performance, low cost solution. And we're really building affordable, high performing autonomy. It's, uh, you know, our full kit from a hardware perspective with, you know, is under five grand ultimately. So it's the camera kit, the perception kit and connectivity ultimately. And where, uh, you know, as autonomy gets to commoditization, we really think the lowest cost high performing solution will win. So this is our uh, thesis. Yeah. So maybe a couple of big takeaways from my career. Feedback's everything. Um, Feed attacks everything and it's even better with paying customers. That's how you actually know if you have product market fit. Even if it's a lower price up front, make sure it's paid for in the startup realm to, to know what's going on. You know, your relationships are huge. And lastly, agriculture is cyc cyclic and harvest is generally once per year, right? Growers get 40 times to perfect the ultimate experiment, right? And harvest their crop. So find other ways to test before testing on a grower's field because the first demo matters. So... And that's what I got. Thank you. Guys, chips. You have to start sitting out. Easy. You do. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sina. All right. Thanks, everybody. So we're going to continue. We have a six startups um, from Mouse Robotics that we're going to give you quick pitches. And then they're going to be around after for some Q&A sessions. So first, I'd like to introduce Carl from Alice Robotics. Well. Let's see. I'm not sure why it's not working. It's cool. No, it's stuck. There we go. There we go. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Carl, thank you. I'm, hi, I'm Carl Palmer, founder and CEO of Boundless Robotics. Um, just by way of introduction, I've been in the industrial automation and robotics space for the last 20 years. Um, more in the manufacturing sector, making things faster, better, and less expensive. And in the third part of my career, I focused on making things uh, with uh, high mixed, low volume kind of applications. And with animation, when you build something, it's great if you're making the same thing over and over again. 
But if you have to change things, it's, it's very challenging for automation. And so we learned that in order to do this very well, it all had to do with user experience and with AI. We could intuit what people wanted to do and we can make it feasible for people to automate these things. And so when I wanted to start a company, I wanted to start a company to solve a problem that terrifies me. And that problem is getting reliable access to food. And then we talked to the about, you know, an aging population, urbanization, climate change, lack of experience. I mean, it's just on and on and on. And so how can we solve these problems um, through technology? And we have to look at all of the solutions in the problem space. And so for us, instead of thinking about uh, urban farming, where you have to pay on, you know, urban um, vertical farms, where real estate is expensive, operations are expensive. We wanted to think about how do we take all of those expenses out of the equation so that we can make it feasible. And we focused on the consumer. So we are on a mission to help people effortlessly grow 5% of their food at home by 2030. And in order for us to do that, we have to think about the urban dweller, because this has to be something that the urban dweller actually has to be able to, to put in their home. Um, we need to think about how, how their lifestyle is and how it will this fit in their, you know, 1200 square foot apartment. Uh, we need to minimize the need for space because obviously they don't want another refrigerator in their home. They want something that is beautiful and that is energy efficient, sustainable. Um, and we need to provide something, the ability to personalize what they're growing, right? We talked about how important this is for people. Where technology does all the hard work, and this is where the robotics and the AI comes in. The technology will do the hard work. The humans can do the fun work. Um, and so you have this grand plan on how to get there. But we're not going to succeed unless we succeed on the first crop that we choose to grow with our systems. And this has to be something that is very hard to grow and where the value is, is high. And it's, it's critical for the life of the consumer who chooses to do this. And for us, that's cannabis. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're growing weeds. Um, and so the reason people are interested in this is we, we typed, I think, AJ or, or somebody earlier on, I'm here focusing on an urgent problem today. When we did our market research, it turns out that people don't think that food scarcity is going to be a problem in the future. They're not really concerned about it. Uh, we know it is, but they're not really concerned. They're not thinking about it. And so, but cannabis is. People today use cannabis for many, many health and wellness reasons. And what people are finding is that it's laced with pesticides. They can't get the strain that they need. There's over 26,000 strains. And they want to grow at home so that they can have something that is consistent. However, bringing it home is very, very difficult and very time consuming. And for people who live in cities that don't have basements or gardens, it's very difficult to grow in your living room because all you can do is have this tent that looks awful and people can't have that. And so we need to find a problem or a solution for this. And already what's interesting is that 6% of cannabis consumers are already growing cannabis at home because they already see this as a problem. And they're spending about $2.7 billion a year on home growing supplies. And this is from 2021. And the market is only going to get bigger. We are legalizing. I think this, this year we've already legalized one state. Uh, Germany just legalized. And so once Germany legalizes, I think a lot more European countries are going to legalize. And the first thing that gets legalized is home growing. So this market is only going to get bigger. And so this is our solution. It's the Anaberto, our AI enabled solution, uh, set it and forget it device for growing high value crops at home. Uh, with it, we are already seeing our customers grow between two and three ounces of high quality pesticide free fresh cannabis. And it's easy. All you have to do is just press a button and add water. The AI takes care of everything else. Uh, all for $1,300, which means that the system can pay for itself in less than six months. So return on investment is a big deal, and we have to create our, our business in order to sustain ourselves and be alive when, when the problem of, of food comes around, uh, we'll have a solution. Uh, we made it easy with automation. Uh, we have artificial intelligence so that we can scale 20 seed in any environment. Like I said, there are 26,000 strains. We can't create recipes for everything. So we have to use AI to be able to deal with all the variation all the different water compositions, everything that exists in, in the space. Uh, the Replix allows us to control the food and the environment accurately, and the hydroponics allows us to grow quickly in less space with fewer pests. Uh, and we made it beautiful so that it can fit in your living environment very well. Uh, the technology is primarily vision-based. We essentially have a camera and the lamp that looks at how the plant is growing. We take a picture every 15 minutes. Based on what we see, we actually adjust the recipe. And then we had a system that learns from all the other systems, your water composition, what you're growing, and we have a system that's reactive. So we don't have to create uh, recipes for anything. We just react to the system and we have wonderful crops growing. 
Uh, we've been beta testing since 2022. Uh, we have a lot of signups. Um, we have $2 million raised in, in pre-seed funding. And the market is huge. There's 43 million people who consume cannabis daily, more than people who do yoga actively. 30% of them are interested in growing at home as long as it's easy. And fails to target demographics of about 2.4 million people. And these represent what we call Techie Tim and Happy Helen. These are um, early 20-somethings to late 30-somethings. These are people with a lot of disposable income um, and who are interested in, in, in the high value, the, the pesticide-free quality and freshness of the product. Um, let me just go through this real quick. We have a team, like I said, that's worked in automation and making it easy for everybody. And so now we're focused on um, cannabis. And I have my fag there. I'm originally from Mexico. I'm not a pothead. I just want to leave that out there. Um, cannabis has actually devastated my country. The war on drugs has been awful. And so I'm very pro legalization. And the fact that we can do this and get away from the black market by helping people grow at home is another benefit of being able to, to grow at home with, with a consumable product. So I look forward to talking to you, to you uh, later and the meet and greet. Thank you very much. He's an official speed talker. Um, okay, next up we have Matt from Haystack. All right. Great, perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Matt Rosen, founder of Haystack Ag. And before we begin, just take a quick moment to show you this. This is a qubit rod. It happens to be one of the earliest known standardized measurement tools in the world. And it was used by the Egyptians to um, measure agricultural land, essentially establish standardized units of trade that allowed marketplaces to scale. And if you take one thing away from today, Haystack is developing modern equivalents of the qubit rod. So tools that efficiently measure agricultural data and in this case, allow soil carbon, excuse me, soil carbon offset markets to scale. So just framing this a little bit, climate change, obviously huge, you know, massive existential risk, um, but also a significant opportunity for companies and economies that can, you know, significantly reduce or remove greenhouse gas emissions. And one way to do that is uh, through carbon offsetting. And so this is when um, a company who has some emissions, you know, hopefully they're doing everything they can to reduce emissions internally. Uh, but for the emissions they can't reduce, they can essentially pay someone else through buying a, a carbon offset or a carbon credit um, to reduce emissions uh, from the atmosphere. And one form of carbon offsetting is uh, can come in the agricultural space through a soil carbon offset. And so essentially what this looks like is soils are already a, a massive pool of carbon. So they contain um, over two times more carbon than the atmosphere and all living vegetation combined. So there's a lot of carbon already in soils. That being said, there's estimates that we could sequester up to nine gigatons CO2 equivalent per year through the adoption of regenerative practices, which are essentially practices that focus on soil health, focus on carbon sequestration in part. And that represents around 20% of greenhouse gas emissions totally. So it's a, a pretty large uh, percentage. And generally just kind of like how this physically works is as plants are being grown, uh, they absorb CO2. Some of that carbon goes into the biomass of the plant. Some moves down into the root system. Uh, and then through either decaying plant matter or through interactions with soil microbes, uh, that carbon then moves into, some of that carbon then moves into the soil, uh, both in organic forms, inorganic forms, and then your total carbon is sort of just the sum of those two. And so effectively, if we can measure how much carbon is being sequestered within a field, uh, that farmer or landowner can get paid for that and essentially get paid in addition to the other crops that they're growing. Uh, but the challenge right now is that doing verification of how much carbon is in a particular field is just, it's very expensive. It's not cost effective for doing this at scale. And so samples traditionally have to be pulled out in the field. Uh, they again, get shipped to a lab. The processing of the lab is, I'll kind of get into, but it's very manual, very labor intensive, slow throughput. So um, labs getting samples now can have six month backlogs, um, pretty data deficient. So we're not really collecting the critical data at the lab that will allow sort of machine learning models to scale over time. And ultimately what that results is in sort of alternate approaches like remote sensing, uh, computer modeling, they're just not very accurate right now. And so you kind of have to do this lab based process. And so just looking at the lab now, like samples come in, there's a ton of uh, manual processing, pre-processing of the sample just to get ready, get it ready to run. And then there's a lot of manual analysis. And so 
ultimately this results in relatively high costs for every sample. You're looking at like 10 to $25. And as I mentioned, um, significant turnaround times for large samples. And so what we're doing at Haystack is really focused on automating this whole process at the lab. So everything through uh, from sample preparation through to analysis. And by doing that, we can reduce costs by over 10, uh, 10 X increase throughput by over 10 X and then really critically also collect the type of, um, data sets that will allow some of these other machine learning uh, models to scale over time. Um, and so, yeah, traditionally there's kind of this cost accuracy trade-off. Um, you have things like remote sensing on one end, low accuracy, um, but relatively low cost. You have things like dry combustion, which are this kind of traditional lab-based approach, high accuracy, but um, very exp kind of cost prohibitively expensive. And so what we're doing is automating uh, that piece at the lab in the dry combustion, collecting spectroscopy data, which both sort of solves the problem now from a, a accuracy standpoint, as well as allows us to scale over time. Um, and then from a kind of like, how do we operate as a business? So we're essentially selling carbon testing services into uh, carbon market intermediaries. So these could be carbon markets themselves. These could be uh, carbon product developers, essentially groups that are working sort of as the in-between between landowners or farmers and selling carbon offsets to, uh, to companies. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just kind of leave you with this. This is looking at uh, carbon potential, essentially carbon sequestration potential around the world. So we're initially focused um, on North America, but there's a lot of projects ongoing in Europe, uh, as well as Australia, South America. Um, and so, yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next up, we have Kent from Robot. Great. Hey, I'm delighted to be here to tell you a little bit about Robot. Uh, it's not a rowing machine, it's for row crops. Uh, and this, I think we're all in trouble with directions, but uh, our customers are corn farmers. So you've probably heard a little bit about uh, the idea here of this is a big combine. So this is where it looks at the end of this the season. It, um, so farmers are harvesting um, many tons per acre um, at over something like 90 million acres in the U.S. So for context, that's about three times the area of all California agriculture. Um, so it's a big, it's a big market. However, it's low value in terms of dollars per acre generated. So it does present challenges. Um, in prison to know, so we sort of, to give you a little idea about the farmers, yes, it's very hard to break in. And people mentioned trust in the panel. That's key. Uh, getting to farmers is very difficult. You can't just drive down the road and go to the farmhouse. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Um, and ultimately, f the, the hope is the farmers will try new technology on a field, not their entire enterprise in a given season. So that's sort of the approach to take. Um, this is what um, our solution looks like in the field. So we drive between rows. So this is a small platform. Uh, this is absolutely not what is commonplace in large scale agriculture. That, um, but our idea is the tools of these small machines can achieve the outcomes of today's large equipment, but do it in a way that's really uh, responsive to the crop. We're, we're delivering nitrogen fertilizer at the right time for the crop rather than the right time for the equipment. And here we're seeing that cover crop. So this is build soil health. Uh, hopefully um, builds uh, carbon in the soil uh, and looks like this the following spring. This is a really nice stand of cereal rye that would be um, um, enable that, that grower to have uh, the soil covered between uh, from, from when the corn is harvested through to when probably soybean is planted on this field. A, a little bit um, more in depth or closer to the machine uh, our patent protected technology drives, as I said, between the row. We have very low clearance. Uh, these rows are spaced 30 inches apart. Our machine's about 24 inches. You can see there's 30 inches is, is nominal. There's there's growth there. So we have very low clearance. Uh, it's, it, but this, this enables us to get in, maybe not to treat every plant, but certainly to uh, treat different areas of the field differently. Um, this is a diesel powered machine because we're generally a long ways away from the charging network uh, and we can carry about 500 pounds of payload. 
Uh, so it's a pretty serious work machine, which is actually very important for our, for our customers because yes, they don't want the, the equipment to fail, but they also want to be able to take it seriously. So you need to show up with something that they will trust. A little marketing there. Um, so, okay, so the question is, we all know that you can't just do robotics for the sake of robotics. Uh, that's sort of a fool's errand. We started in not to start a robotics company. Um, the, the family story there is an interesting one. I started with my brother, uh, who's a large-scale farmer. We set out to solve what we believe is the largest problem facing large-scale ag, and that is the inefficient use of nitrogen fertilizer. It's the most expensive input after purchasing the seed, but worldwide, we're probably wasting half of it, meaning it's ending up in the atmosphere, in the water, polluting groundwater, downstream ecosystem damage, or nitrous oxide as a, a really potent greenhouse gas. Uh, so we want to change that. And part of the challenge here is corn goes from short stature to tall in several weeks. This is the time it's taking up nitrogen. The easy time to put on nitrogen is months before this. Uh, and so nitrogen's lost very easily. Um, so we're trying to, to change that equation, have equipment that can apply the fertilizer, do other jobs that's in sync with the need for the plant. Uh, so where we are, um, our, our advanced prototypes, we've been on hundreds uh, or mobile fields, close to 40 in the Midwest, uh, real fields, customer fields. We've delivered 100 acres of fully autonomous cover crop seeding. Uh, we're ready to, we're prepared to commercialize. Uh, we just signed a term sheet with the largest um, cooperative in Iowa. So this is a family owned uh, organization that uh, sells fertilizer seed to farmers. Just like we go to the fruit co-op, farmers go to various co-ops. Uh, and so they've, they've agreed to purchase our first 100,000 acres, uh, which gives us uh, a strong market signal so that we can now go to capital markets to, to support that growth. Thank you. Except for the bonded family for us. So I want to press this button, but I'm sure it's the wrong one. I'm going to press the other one. This right, yeah. Because that one says, like, press me. So no, I press that one. All right. My name is Ander. I'm the CEO of Uberos, and we make soft grippers for the uh, food industry, specifically for agricultural products like Kuchitz. Um uh, the main problem that we saw, Peter presented, there are many killers and the middle one was packing and uh, thickening and packing. It's a large uh, a space within the agriculture right when they're collected. Can you get me? We can. Oh, just crack. Yeah, recording. Right. So, um, so it's a large space within the agricultural uh, industry. Uh, or fruit industry, so we are solving the issue of needing to use or having to use humans to pack these delicate items. And uh, why do we think it's a problem? Everybody said over here that labor shortage is there, so you cannot find these people. Even if you find them, they're not that interested. Yes, there is no career advancement opportunities for them. None of these people uh, have a dream of still there and doing the same job over and over and over. Um, and uh, we better use them somewhere else where they can't actually have uh, uh, dreams of their own. Um, so our uh, solution to this problem is part of the bigger solution, obviously, that everybody presented today, is actually having a dexterous uh, end effector that can handle these uh, delicate items with the care that uh, they need. Uh, so we built a soft uh, rubber gripper that handles these peaches or tomatoes or apples or cucumbers that are very delicate uh, with care. Uh, we also made it significantly affordable uh, uh, compared to humans or other robotic equipment out there. Um, it's an electric plug and play, so for for farmers or people who are in this business can actually take it out of the box, put it on their robot if they're currently using a robot. If not, obviously there's going to be some integration with the robots. And uh, lastly, they're lightweight, so it doesn't actually require a lot of strength on the robot side. Uh, doesn't use the um, end effectors, you know, payload. So obviously in agriculture uh, and food industry, there's also this other space where uh, farmers, uh, meat farmers, uh, chicken farmers, so they need uh, 
as opposed to the delicacy, the, the fungible nature of these items. So traditional grippers and robotic systems cannot handle uh, these soft items because they are uh, elusive. Uh, so our grippers can handle those real well too. And here is where I explain when soft grippers and my grippers are uh, best suited. So the best way to figure out what is a grip tool for you is to uh, envision your product and then plot it over here on this graph. So I have a variety of criteria. Uh, so object variation. And in Ford industry, we know our tomatoes are the same size. So they're always chained in cells because they grow differently. Uh, precision need that you typically don't assemble things and you don't put, you know, tomatoes in kind of tight areas. Precision needs are low. Uh, weight that we are not dealing with kilograms per, uh, per item. Uh, we typically are handling, you know, under, uh, 100 grams. So it's like about a quarter of a pound. Um, so they're fragile, highly fragile. And their surface finish, it was not shiny and polished, maybe wrap over a little bit, but most things, most uh, fruits have either a shell, either porous, uh, they might have a little bit of hair on them or whatnot. So a lot of the products are not going to be suitable for many of the other uh, gripper types like rigid grippers or suction cups. They bruise them. So soft grippers, as you can see, uh, have a nice kind of the green line. Uh, are really good uh, fits for items like produce. And the next one, I kind of decided the produce over here. Are they kind of tracks along the, the soft gripper line where soft grippers are strong? There are other items where rigid grippers or suction cups are better. But uh, for produce example, um, I would say uh, soft grippers are best fit. And here is the question, where does your product buy? Can you fit your product on this graph and see which line it is close to? And if you want to talk more about this, find me in the, um, in the reception. Have a good rest of your day. Great. Thank you. Next up we have until. That happened. Can you well? He be good enough. So which, which is the button? So I broke it. Uh, I draw, I can use the thing that you are. There you go. Let's see. Hey. Uh, so you just hit the, the up button. No. Oh, there you go. If you do it that way. All right. All right. Hello everyone. I'm Ahmed and this is Until. We're a seed stage ag tech company bridging the gap between farm and fork. So have anyone ever asked, have you guys ever asked yourself, like, where does my food actually come from? Or how is it that I can eat fresh green vegetables in the dead of winter? Well, the answer is quite shockingly long. It usually starts in California or Arizona. And over that 3000 mile journey, our food typically loses half of its nutritional value. Um, and, and what makes things even worse is half of the product that we harvest doesn't actually make it to its final destination. So that's the process and problem that we're trying to solve that until. We've created a farming platform that allows us to grow food closer to where consumers are eating it. We can cut down the supply chain from eight days to under 24 hours. And we can boost the shelf life of the product from two days to over two weeks in customers' fridges, all while cutting down the carbon emissions and carbon footprint of our food by over 30%. Now, we've mentioned vertical farming in this room before, so I'm not going to really explain what that is, but that's basically what we do. Um, but what makes our vertical farm and our tech platform different? Well, we figured out a way to make it actually profitable and not just in the niche direct to consumer distribution channels that some other of our competitors are doing, but in the traditional wholesale pallet size distribution channel, which makes our platform an actual viable way to distribute and produce at large scale. So we spent years doing a lot of research and developing our hardware, our control software, and our growing techniques uh, with Northeastern University. And what makes vertical farming work and what makes you succeed in vertical farming is not only the operational efficiency, but also the working with the plants and knowing how they work to put, really push them to their limits. So I'm going to introduce you to our farm in Hudson, Massachusetts. 
It's fully automated from seed all the way to harvest. And because our process is so unique, we actually had to develop our hardware and our software in-house. And it's designed purpose-built specifically for what it's being used. And that allows us much better ROIs than all of our other competitors. I mentioned our control software, it actually has a feedback loop built within it. And that gives us plant level traceability on the field. Um, but also it allows the farm a lot of autonomy so it can react to the plant's health autonomously as the plants are growing. In the interest of efficiency, uh, we've broken down our field into modular growing units, as we like to call them. That gives us a lot of flexibility from an operations perspective, but it also reduces our downtime to, of our farm to almost zero. This is hopefully the smallest farm we'll ever build. It uh, has a production capacity of 125,000 pounds a year, and it sits on about 8,000 square feet of warehouse space. Uh, so this is where we really shine from a unit economics perspective comparing to our co competitors. Um, as I mentioned, we did a lot of research in the plant science world, and we figured out how to push the plants significantly. And our plants grow from seed to harvest in 11 days for our baby leafy greens, which uh, gives our farms significantly more productivity than anyone else's. And as I mentioned, the, the modularity of our fields reduces our downtime to almost zero. That combined with the way we irrigate um, and the density of our planting gives our farm six times the productivity in the same space as anyone else does. This is anyone else in vertical farming specifically. And from a cost perspective, we use nine times less power and run our farms with half the number of people. And those are the two largest cost buckets when it comes to vertical farming. Quickly over our business model, we're owner operators today. Uh, we've been selling in the market with our launching product line since January, but to scale, we're planning on partnering with entrepreneurs, farmers, whoever may be interested to package up our entire tech platform with our brand and our software into a franchise model. Um, today, uh, we have partnered with Wilson Farm, one of the leading produce distributors in New England and one of the oldest in the business. Uh, carries our product and distributes it uh, all over New England. And this is what it actually looks like. Um, this is the inside of the farm in Hudson as it's growing food. And today it's six years high, but we, we have the capability of going up to 12. See how it's super densely packed uh, compared to other vertical farms or even field grown or greenhouse grown. And that's where we really win in our economics. This is our kale crop, and that's our wild medley crop, which is our take on a spring mix. I can go into further depth about what goes into the technology, all of the nuts and bolts, there's just a lot of it, so we can talk about that later if you guys are interested. Thank you very much. Oh, no. Make it fall. Thank you. And now I'm happy to introduce Yard Robotics. You talk. Just use this, eh? Good. Yo, man, I didn't expect for him to get fully good. Hello, hello. My name is Divya. I'm the founder of Yard Robotics. So we are in the business of maintaining ornamental turf, automation of grass. So something more different than some of the stuff you guys have heard. Uh, just covering our target customers today, how it works and how we're different from what's going on right now. These are our target customers. So this may or may not be a common site in Massachusetts, but this is very common across the country. A lot of people live in these kind of homes and all that green in there needs to be maintained on a consistent basis. These are our customers. Now the grass is brown because it's dormant, but typically it's green. And we do about a hundred acres of mowing every two weeks at the moment with our, our technology. So what happens? What's going on here? People are looking for lawn care. They're too busy or they have mobility issues and they want somebody to come in and take care of their lawn. Call the lawn guy. It's some random person. They may or may not show up. They may want to check to pay for it. And it's really a communication or reliability challenge that exists in the industry right now. So the way we solve it is we use a fleet of autonomous robots to automate the easy stuff and use humans for the intricate work. So our food is modular so we can swap out our tooling, whether it's mower with fertilization or weed control, it's autonomous or it's uh, 
uh, called level five autonomy. Based on what Peter said, you know, we're looking to get the human out of the loop here. Commercial use, so it's not something you buy and keep in your house because more utilization, as somebody mentioned, we're looking for getting eight to 10 hours of utilization out of these robots on a daily basis. Electric for reasons, and then collaborative, so you can put multiple robots on a singular plot. So this is an example of how we grow about. This is how we actually do this. So this is a um, about five acre track. We take something like this, we run a robot around it, and we basically build a 3D point cloud off um, the the field. So we can typically do this in about five minutes for a residential yard. This yard's a little bigger, so it takes a little bit longer. This is now a plot of land that I'll get into. We call it Pecan Hill. It says near us, so this is uh, a site. Here's what it looks like on point cloud format. And once we have something like this, we can run it through our planner. So we have a planning tool that just tells us, hey, we want a certain cut direction. We want preferences that want to cut in a certain direction. They want to um, uh, change direction the course of the season. So I can encode all that information into a plan and we can download that into our robots. And let's see, I show you how that looks like. This is what our robots look like. So in this case, we decided we'll deploy two of them. So based on what the customer needs, but how fast they want it done, we can deploy a single robot, two robots, five robots, as fast as they want to get it done. And uh, I actually have to have one of these robots outside if, you, if you're interested in taking a look. Uh, how do you see the future? I think uh, I'll say the three things I want to mention is, you know, selling hardware stuff. So we'll just offer service. So folks talked about this today. Uh, it's a way to go do an in-place replacement for what people are already accustomed to. Um, we think that the cost of autonomy is going to go down. So it's a little bit different. We're building smaller robots rather than building giant machines. As somebody mentioned, you know, you want to do incremental work on existing machines. You know, we're taking a different approach. It's a non-consensus approach. We're doing a full platform that's scratch, uh, from scratch. All right, that's it. Uh, and I will keep you from your snack. So thanks for listening. Yeah, it's Detroit Tanked. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, now we have some um, a reception if you want to hang around to have discussions, um, networking. So thank you so much. Okay, please.